All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, this is going to be a really interesting uh, presentation and panel. I'm, I'm super interested to hear all the details myself. We're going to be talking about a, a ballot initiative that actually passed in Oregon uh, very recently and uh, this really unique legislative campaign there to win Medicare for all in the state of Oregon. Um, so I would like to welcome my two guests uh, and, and leaders in the movement from Oregon. Uh, Tom Sinsick, do you want to uh, introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, my name is Tom Sinsick. I'm a retired family nurse practitioner and uh, working for a universal single payer healthcare system is pretty much what I like to do every day of the week. And one of the things that drives me to this was the uh, work as a clinician, working on the issues of prior authorizations, approvals, and the obstruction that insurance companies uh, gave in in terms of patients getting care. And in particular, having the wrong kind of insurance, even if it's private insurance, can cause a person to die. I know a 16 year old who was referred away from the clinic where there was a mental health therapist available, right down the hall in a school, but was told because they had private insurance, they should go to that private insurer. That 16 year old, very depressed, never made it. And I ended up taking care of that person's sister for the wow. next three years in the clinic avoiding the rigmarole of the mental health therapist. So those are the mm -hmm. things that drive me to do this work. Wow, that's unreal. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Hayden, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Hayden Rookley with Healthcare for All Oregon. Uh, I'm from Oregon. I'm actually finishing up law school right now down at Stanford. Um, prior to uh, moving back to Oregon, uh, before law school, I worked for a number of years in DC on uh, federal healthcare policy, including uh, as a healthcare staffer in Congress. So re really uh, excited to be here. Great. Well, welcome. Thanks so much, both of you, for joining us. We're going to jump into a slideshow now, and we'll shrink ourselves down to little mini speakers and moderators here. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, Healthcare for All Oregon is the organization leading the charge here in, uh, in Oregon. Um, we are driven by the values, just what Tom was talking about, the injustices of our healthcare system. Um, and uh, Tom, can you tell me a little bit about this graphic that you all pulled together that kind of captures the steps that this process is moving through to try and win a uh, universal healthcare system in Oregon. Yeah. Well, this was uh, steps were strategically designed, right? In order to be strategic and organized, we had to have a framework under which we have been working. And in spite of COVID, we have been able to begin to work through these steps. And right now, what we're gonna focus on is uh, the right to healthcare vote, which is up there in the middle, and the right healthcare bill, which is right above the vote. But we're gonna to continue to move up those stairways. And we'll talk a little bit more about that short, shortly. In particular, take note that community engagement is absolutely an essential part every step of the way in doing this work. And we had community engagement before the task force started. We had community engagement with the task force. There was community engagement with the final report of the task force. There's been community engagement every, every step of the way. So keep that all in mind. All right, and if none of these steps make sense to you as a listener, we're gonna to get to all of them. If you don't know what the task force is or the vote is or the bill, we are gonna cover all the different pieces of it. Um, so Hayden, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what exactly is this uh, right to healthcare amendment that came up in Oregon as measure 111 or the HOPE amendment, which is much better branding? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, certainly. Um, measure 111 or the HOPE amendment uh, really a first of its kind uh, state constitutional amendment that codified um, not just a, a right to health care, but a right to cost effective, clinically appropriate and affordable health care. Um, and this was an amendment again passed um, in the fall of 2022 um, that really is distinct in terms of, um, of being this specific about um, a right to, again, cost effective, clinically appropriate and affordable health care. And, you know, Oregonians going to the ballot and saying we want to codify this in our constitution because um, we believe this as a, as a value um, should be uh, provided to all Oregonians. Right. And I feel like this might have fallen under the radar nationally a little bit. A lot of people might not know that a ballot initiative like this passed in, in Oregon. Um, I mean, what, was it a close vote? Was this a hard fight to win or? Yeah, I mean, we uh it was a uh, um, the numbers, I think, uh, you know, Tom might be able to speak a little bit to, you know, specifically how it passed. Um, I think uh, we certainly were outspent um, in terms of our opposition, uh, you know, mobilizing to pass this constitutional amendment. 
Um, but, you know, we, I, I think weren't surprised to see that Oregonian stepped up and said, you know, we want to, again, proclaim this in our constitution that, you know, we believe in an equitable healthcare system that's going to provide, um, you know, for everybody. We, I would add that we had 58 uh, organizations partnering with us in this effort, mm -hmm. so, a, a, but the amount of money to pass a constitutional amendment, literally 10 cents per vote is what it cost us. When you think about some votes cost $10 or $20 to vote to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this was really a win when you think about the level of dollar investment, but we had the people investment and that came through. All right. And I, I I have a feeling with things like this, it might get more expensive down the road, but um, let's let's get to down the road later as we talk about this. So uh, Hayden, so what was kind of the outcome of this? Um, uh, what does it mean to to add a constitutional amendment that makes makes healthcare right? Is this actually going to be implemented right away or what, what happens as a result? Yeah, it, you know, as a as a legal matter, it sort of, uh, it, you know, it depends. Um, I, I think, as I said before, um, it's unprecedented in terms of the specificity with which you know it codifies a, a right to healthcare in um, a state constitution. Um, it's not unprecedented though uh, when you look across the sweep of states in terms of um, states proclaiming certain rights in their constitutions. We're you know we're all sort of used to I think paying attention to the federal constitution, um, which comparatively actually has you know few specifically stated rights. Um, but if you look across the country at state constitutions, it's not atypical. Um, for these constitutions to, again, like define um, rights that we associate more with sort of like policymaking. Uh, you know, the education sphere is a good sort of analog here. Um, most, if not all, state constitutions uh, define a, a, a right to or codify a right to health care or, excuse me, a right to education in their, um, uh, in their constitutions. And right. it's, uh, you know, it varies in terms of how courts, state Supreme Courts are talking about interpreting their state constitution. Um, it really varies in terms of how um, they interpret those education provisions um, right. in terms of what it, it basically compels the state legislature to do. Um, you know, in certain states, uh, state Supreme Courts have been more active in terms of basically saying if there's a particular right to say, you know, a um, adequate public education, some Supreme Courts have stepped in and said, you know, the existing financing of education is inadequate. And they've basically struck down the system and sent it back to the state legislature and said, um, essentially, you need to do better. Um, this is we're in, un, you know, in the healthcare sphere, we're in un, uncharted territory here because, you know, certain states, while certain states have some health language, um, it's very vague in general. Um, so it tends to be thought of as kind of precatory or symbolic and not necessarily compelling uh, the state legislature or the people to act in a, in a specific sort of way. Um, as I've mentioned a number of times, what's new about the Oregon uh, language in the Constitution is that it's very specific about, um, you know, cost effective, clinically appropriate, affordable health care. So um, depending on how and whether the state legislature acts in response to this, um, you know, you could see something like this come through the courts. You know, if our system, uh, we're all aware of sort of the fundamental sort of inequities within our health care system. Um, if things continue to get worse, particularly, let's say, in the, the, the provider health care sphere where we're seeing um, you know, greater deductibles, more cost sharing, medical bankruptcy. You know, there's an example of folks who uh, really aren't getting affordable health care. So if things continue to worsen, you could imagine, um, you know, suits being brought in the courts to ask the uh, the state state judges to interpret this provision of the Constitution and make a determination as to whether we're, um, you know, the state is upholding uh, what the people passed as a, a fundamental right to um, health care. So um, all right, that right. to say, uh, you know, it's unclear how how courts might look at that or how the, specifically the Oregon Supreme Court would look at this. Um, but certainly we're hoping that, you know, it doesn't need to get to that and that, uh, you know, the state legislature um, sees this as, um, you know, another impetus to act and to get us to the type of, you know, single payer system that we know would satisfy, uh, you know, this language in the that's now in the Oregon Constitution. All right. Really interesting. I, you know, I live here in Massachusetts, which was the first state to make education a, a public right many, many years ago. Actually, I think the first in the world. Um, but it's it's good to hear that this healthcare language was way more specific than we get with education, where you can you, we there is a right to public education, but of course you end up with kind of wildly inequitable uh, uh, access to education uh, because of the lack of very specific language around it. So um, clearly, you all thought ahead about this. Um, so, Tom, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what this means for kind of the broader movement for Medicare for All or movement for universal health care? 
both in, in Oregon, but also for, for all the other states? Well, uh, let's start with Oregon, of course. Well, what this means is the state legislature knows that they've gotten a message from the people. But the good news is, on top of that, is the, our state legislature is acting. And we'll be talking about that shortly, right? And so in particular, what I brought up about this slide is, how can we use this right to advance legislative policy? Well, we paint out the picture between the current system and the universal single payer system. And now we've know, already known about the simplicity, affordability, inequities, everyone, we've talked about everyone included, but now in the middle of that, we have healthcare is a right in one system and not the other system. And that added impetus that sends a clear message to the state legislature is really important. Now, in particular, um, and these slides are gonna be available and there's links in the slides that people can find out more about some of the details. But in, in particular, that item we're putting in all of our messaging now to the legislature, right? You've got a, a constitutional obligation to come through with this constitutional amendment. Now, what we've said, some states always going first, maybe this could be for the nation, one is to say, maybe we can get something passed like this in in our state, maybe Michigan, which is just uh, codified and changed their abortion rights law. So, um, th th I, so whether it's that in the constitution or Oregon going and implementing that single payer system down the way, that is what it could mean for the nation. So. Okay. And it sounds like, you know, although this constitutional provision does give you, maybe it gives the, the residents of Oregon some legal leverage to demand the universal health care system, the, the plan, the hope is to get legislation passed, which is what we kind of want to focus on next year. Yeah. So there is so this. Let me go ahead. Let me yeah. go ahead and back this up. Let's just say our Oregon legislature, and this is part of the strategic plan, mm -hmm. gave us the task force. The Oregon legislature put forward that ballot measure on the ballot. We didn't have to gather the votes. People should understand right. that. Yeah. The, um, the legislature is now leading the way in the bill to advance single payer. So we're very lucky with that. So there we go. Yes, I love the idea of a, a state legislature passing a bill, asking residents to tell them to pass another bill. Uh, but it, it, it seems like it's working. So can you tell us a little bit more about this legislative pathway, Senate Bill 1809, and how are we going to, to get there? So what's the pathway to passing this? Okay. Thing? The purpose of this image is to say, we never know which road we're going on. But when we get on that road, we have to have a plan to deal with it. And the lucky news is, you know, regardless of which of these roads, smoother to the right, left, or center, we're going to go and we're going to get the job done into that bright place in the future, which is single-payer health care. So if you go to the next slide, then it will... Yeah, and maybe that you can explain the stairs more here. So yeah, now I can explain. <laughs> so uh, we're going to hear a little bit more. What I want to say is, the let's start with the task force report, um, and how that affects the the bill, the one zero eight nine bill. The task force report, the items in there are directly extracted from there into the right writing of the bill, and that's what's so exciting. There's a set of purposes, values, and principles. And so that's how they're interrelated. So that's really what counts. We've got the task force report, literally writing the language for the bill, it, its purposes, values, and principles, as you'll see. And can you then tell me, Tom, the yeah, was, the, was the task force created after the ballot initiative passed the legislature no. then, or was it before the ballot initiative? That's good. No, the task force was uh, created in 2019 by mm -hmm. a vote of the legislature. Great group of people. We learned some lessons about uh, what should make up a task force that's really going to advance single payer. And they mm -hmm. did with a great report, which is available uh, through our website uh, at ACO.org. Okay. So we can we can link that up actually right in the, the, the plenary uh, thing as well. So, OK, so this this thing came uh, came before the ballot initiative, but it's September now 30th, September 30th of 2022. And the ballot was voted on November 8th. 2022 with voting started by mail mid shortly mid-october so a couple of weeks after this task force report the voting started mm -hmm. and the the task force uh information is now helping to inform the legislation that's being developed is that right absolutely okay 
Okay. So what was the what was the the goal of this task force that was kind of created before the, okay. the ballot initiative right. was was on the ballot? Well, there it is, right? A well functioning single payer healthcare finance system that is responsive to the needs and expectations of residents by these purposes, values, and principles that again you could go forward. Right. And um, people who worry about a vague universal healthcare language, there's single payer written right into that. Right. That several places, so. several places actually yeah. in the mm -hmm. in that bill. And uh, so in adopting the bill, right, uh, you know, how do we get through this, right? We, we had legislative champion in Senator James Manning and to, uh, somebody on the House side and the Senate side both introduced what's called pre-session filings in Oregon. And that's something they put forward no later than the first week of December, I think, it has to be filed by. And they were identical thing to create a universal health plan governance mm -hmm. board. And there's been a few amendments, but it was just, you know, just a couple lines to introduce and make a space for this to occur, right? Mm -hmm. And again, as I said, the bill was then redrafted enough times to be based on the task force report. Okay, and, gotcha. Uh, yeah. And we're going to get into some of the details here. If you want to explain this uh, baseball players hiding their face, you can, and then tell us what kind of the key elements of that, that yeah. Medicare for All bill are. Well, I saw that thing because some of the stuff that goes on in the legislature is not transparent. Oh, you don't uh, say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell us what's going on. Even us advocates sometimes that are working closely with the, the legislatures don't get to know the, some of the behind the scenes conversations. Mm -hmm. But we have to trust those people that are our champions, that they're doing the right thing for us out in the field. And the other hand is sometimes we as advocates, when we're making our plans, we should keep it a message to keep us ourselves a little more tightly held at times than we want to be. We tend to be telling everything out. So that's just a reminder. So everything doesn't have to be out in the open. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'd love to talk about the key elements of this bill, uh, right? First of all, the, the next step as the task force had one recommendation, that was to create the Universal Health Plan Governance Board. And that's what it does, right? That's the, what, the main thing. And basically the purpose is the same purposes of the task force, right? That's what's in next, right? And along with some values and principles directly from the task force report. And okay. it, what's really important now, the key element is to get enough funding. That is where we're at in the process as we speak. Um, and so as this is being recorded, there's the discussions about having enough funding. So they have to have enough funding for the staff and the contractors. But the governor will appoint an executive director as soon as this bill passes in this year, an executive director for this governance board will be um, take place. And the governance board itself will be appointed during the course of this year. And so that's basically it. And the great thing about this is there's a very specific timeline in the bill. And the reporting back of this bill begins uh, in 2024 and ongoing each legislative session. So we'll be able to make an uh, adaption as we go forward to what the needs are, right? Okay, so this universe, just to clarify, this Universal Health Plan Governance Board, this is not this is not overseeing a universal healthcare system yet. Is that correct? This is yep. just... But the, the eventual thing would be, yes, this governance board, I, I should say, um, this Universal Health Care Plan Governance Board will be in our Department of Consumer and Business Services to start. But eventually, not shown on the slide, is that we hope eventually to put that into a public corporation, right? With the dollars all going into a public trust. So okay. that's the eventual plan. This is the startup to, uh, and they'll bring forward this recommendation of an implementation. And right. without going back to the stairs, you'll see eventually we have to have another bill and an eventual vote of the a vote by the voters. Right. So this is somewhat similar to the Vermont process, although not, not entirely comparable where they had a green mountain care board that was created and formed in part to develop the universal healthcare system that it would then have a, uh, an administrative role in administering. Does that sound, is that a fair comparison? I, I would think yes. Okay, great. So uh, you were just talking about how uh, the purposes, values, and principles of the bill came directly from the task force. Do you want to talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, just uh, briefly. Um, 
that these are our guiding items that we don't want to let go of. Cost shall not be a barrier, uh, choice of providers, uh, no medical debt, you know, and uh, in addition, we want to have a public health focus, right? A, a primary goal to improve the health status of individuals, families, and communities. So that is basically it. There's a purposes, values, and principles. I think there's a total of 17. Again, don't have to read through this, but I think B here is really uh, key. Covers everybody, right? Now, no discrimination based on these categories. And we said as much as we could without going on and on and on. And right. we've been sticking right. to this all the way. Okay, so now we get to kind of the important part, which is what what are the next steps? What lies ahead for actually winning this thing? Um, uh, so, Hayden, do you want to talk about some pieces of this, and then Tom, you can you can talk about other pieces about the next steps? Yeah, sure. Um, Tom and I can can tag team this All one. Right. Um, I, I think Tom has touched on you know a number of the. I guess imperatives of, of passing legislation this session and then moving on to establishing um this board that's really going to uh you know carry on the work of the task force and i think it's worth emphasizing a couple points that, that tom brought up on the task force um it was a really promising report that they um came out with which you know i don't think will will surprise advocates here um but i think um is worth uh sort of publicizing as much as we possibly can um that you know, we can set up the type of single payer healthcare system that we want to see that's free service to everybody at the point of care, um, that covers all benefits, um, that doesn't treat certain patients as more lucrative than other patients, um, and does so at um, a cost that's actually slightly less than we're currently paying for our healthcare system. Um, in Oregon, the rough numbers are basically, you know, we spend about $50 billion in our healthcare system in, in Oregon right now. And a publicly financed system that got rid of um, all sorts of waste, um, including, you know, in primarily the um, the amount of money we waste in the insurance system, um, we could, again, provide uh, free care to everybody um, for a, a lower cost than that 50, you know, than that, that top line of 50 billion. Um, and the work of the task force carrying forward is to dig down a level deeper from that aggregate number and figure out exactly how we're going to get access to federal funding, how we're going to raise um, revenues that are currently going to privately administered health insurance. Um, so that work sort of carrying forward the details um, is what we're really excited to see in the, the governance board. Right. Um, but the top line here is that the, the work of the task force over the last couple of years um, really sort of conceptually proved um, and also empirically proved with the you know, analysis they did at the aggregate level um, that we can provide the type of system we want to see and that it's not going to sort of break the bank. You know, I think there's a lot of misconception around Medicare for all sure. and, you know, the inability to do it maybe at the state level because you can't go into debt and all these other things. Um, really, the type of system we want to see can be financed um, by spending no more and, in fact, by spending less um, than we currently are um, right now. Tom, do you want to take some of the, the, the more specifics here about carrying the, the governance board yeah. forward? Yeah, let me back up just a hair, but get the bill passed, right? So just for people to kind of catch up to current, right, as of this moment, this is now in going in front of the Rules Committee. And it's interesting, um, we've got to get it passed out of rules um, and then to the Ways and Means Committee. And the Ways and Means Committee will do the final decision about the funding. And I'd like to point for that top one, which says community engagement always. We've got people talking to every legislator in the state. So when we had the um, uh, the first hearing on this thing, there were over 300 pieces of written testimony submitted in favor, only a handful opposed. And on the second day of public testimony, there were 28 people signed up in favor and nobody opposed. We'll see what happens down the line. So we're gonna have to continue to be build partnerships. We've had partnerships and messages from all of these groups, I would say at this point, except the hospitals, but they're coming on board now. We've had some serious struggles with some hospital closures and financing here in this state, particularly in the rural areas. And uh, um, that's basically kind of what that is. So we're, it's good news that the building of the partnerships has been an important part of this. Right. And I jumped ahead to the, the coalition slide here because you were talking about it. But is there anything else about next steps here either well, you wanted I think to touch you, on? It, it really tells what has to happen. 
we've got the executive director, the board has to be appointed, the staff and consultants. And then we have to get down to the back, bottom line, where is it going? Grassroots education organizing always will have to be really there to make sure the right board gets appointed, just like the right task force got appointed. We'll have to make sure the right board gets appointed. And then of course, that will be recommendations back to the legislature from the board, and then eventually to the people. That's how we get to that finish line that you saw in an earlier slide. Okay, so this ends up back on the ballot at the end, ultimately? That, that's all likely to happen. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, anything else you wanted to add, Hayden, on these next steps before we we'll get into obstacles, challenges, how to overcome them? Okay, so we've covered the process. Um, all right, so here's a tough question. Um, obviously, um, we don't expect the healthcare industry to sort of lay down and let almost any state really enact a, a true uh, public healthcare system, universal uh, healthcare system, since there's so many players with money at, at stake here and so many middlemen who can potentially be cut out from a universal healthcare system or at least have their, their um, price gouging limited. Um, everyone from pharma to insurance brokers all the way up to insurance companies. I don't need to tell you guys this. Um, so um, what are some of the sort of obstacles you're you're looking at, uh, both from uh, that you've seen in Oregon already, uh, just having gone a ways down this road and this, this campaign, uh, but also from other states? Um, I guess I'll start with, uh, with Hayden. Yeah, I mean, I think the you're right to note at the top here, you know, insurers being an obstacle. I think the way I touched on this a little bit before, um, you know, the way the task force devised the program, um, I think was smart in terms of um, really, you know, getting savings from um, the insurance industry. Um, the program, the, the task force report, um, you know, another misconception here, what it doesn't do is cut provider rates. Um, again, if we talk, if we think about the amount of money we're spending in the healthcare system right now, um, we can get to the type of system we want to have um, without cutting provider rates and again taking savings from um, just the, the the just Byzantine system of, of insurance that we have where we waste so much on billing and coding and physicians and providers having to deal with a million different insurers. Um, those administrative costs are 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 real and they're substantial and they um, you know we think they can be better directed towards um, you know better covering people um, to get care. So, um, I think the the ins insurers will certainly be an obstacle, um, but we think we can um, work with a lot of other stakeholders, whether it's the um, you know advocates, whether it's labor, whether it's the business community who's um, you know has a real strong case to get out of the business of insurance. Um, that sort of uh, is a is a nightmare for for any sort of business. Um, and then also we think you know as Tom alluded to, we think the hospital sector. You know we're hopeful that um, you know. Uh, again, particularly hospitals, we're seeing this nationwide that are in, um, you know, rural areas, sort of, sort of semi-rural areas. Um, they all survive on this, 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 this sort of inhumane system, or they try to survive on this system that um, one just just treats patients differently. So if you're serving, you know, a if you're serving a disproportionately Medicaid or uninsured population, we all know this story. You're simply getting you're getting half the money to see a patient. No wonder it's difficult to keep your doors open. Um, and then you're also running on the system of um, basically volume based, uh, you know, PPS perspective payment system that we've devised in Medicare and that the commercial insurance also uses where um, to stay open. If you're in a less populated area, you really have to work to get people through your doors. Um, and we know this is this is just no way to set up a system. And, um, you know, under a Medicare for all system, we would we would distribute funding from the state level or, you know, if we were ever to do this nationally. Um, to fund hospitals like we fund a, you know, a fire department. We give them the operating costs that we need. We don't give them more that they can invest in stock markets or that they can, you know, invest in further capital projects, um, but we give them what they need to operate and we get out of this business of, um, of really disproportionately treating how we, how we uh, you know, supply and distribute healthcare. And I think that's the big yeah. thing that Tom talked about earlier. This isn't a struggle just about covering everybody. This is about uh, actually having a rational system that distributes healthcare services to where they're needed, not to where they're most profitable. Yeah. Um, so I'll end it up off to, to, to Tom to talk about more of the, more of the obstacles. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, and Tom, well, can I, you speak specifically to this legislative obstruction item in the slide? Yes, it, pretty e yeah. easy. You know, it, it, it talks about the framework we use to advance our stuff. So this is a, mm -hmm. a hair outdated because in order to get where we were, we did look at these obstacles. 
And I'll just go for the Oregon one. The or insurers had been at the table in a prior work group around universal health care. The work group didn't bring things yes, forward the way it was doomed intended. to fail, I'd say. <laughs> right, right. There wasn't enough community in the process. We've talked about, we've had community engagement now every step of the way. We do have a legislative champion, more than one. So on the bill in SB 1089, out of 17 Democrat senators, Democratic senators, 13 have already signed on. And the chair of the Ways and Means Committee is one of those signers. And that's the person that really makes a difference as to how far this goes. So, um, and so that's kind of the, uh, you know, we learned the lessons, we've addressed those lessons. And that's the good news. And we, we don't, we're not having a lot of legislative obstruction yet, but we're gonna have to watch for that going forward. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the kind of immediate next bumps in the road. And uh, Hayden, you had previously mentioned some uh, folks who think you, you can't do this at the state level, pointing specifically at ERISA and other waivers that you need uh, from the federal government. Can you talk a little bit about how you all are approaching those? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think there are a couple different different issues here. I think to take ERISA first, this is an area that where I found there's there seems to be a lot of um, yeah, confusion or misunderstanding about sort of how ERISA interacts with, um, a, you know, single payer at this. And you might have to step uh, back and explain even what ERISA is and just like square one on this one. But you know. de yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the short answer here is that, you know, ERISA is not inconsistent with state based single payer. Um, ERISA is a federal statute um, that essentially pre preempts states from regulating um, about half of their health, their commercial health insurance market. So specifically, it, it um, prohibits a state from um, regulating the um, the employers in the state who self-insure, who take on risk themselves to provide health insurance. And that's about 50 to 60 percent. Right. Usually the big employers, um, right? Like big Yeah, companies. the big employers. Yeah. Um, and so you know, there, there, there's some thought that this, you know, sort of per se or outright prohibits a state-based single payer healthcare system. Um, that's just not the case. So, uh, you know, we've had uh, numerous healthcare, you know, legal scholars have looked at this. Um, the task force that was set up in California through their process has looked at this. The Oregon task force um, looked, uh, looked in detail at this issue. Um, and there are a number of ways to sort of um, uh, to get around, if you will, um, ERISA, which again is not really circumventing. It's just it's, the law is simply not inconsistent with a single payer healthcare system. And just just maybe to name two that are that are pretty straightforward. Um, one is that um, you know the way that we talked about, you know, a single payer healthcare system is a publicly financed system. Uh, you know, employers instead of paying uh, you know a health insurance company. Um, they're going to pay the, you know, the state financed fund that's going to administer the, administer the single payer healthcare system. So, um, without doing anything, it, you know, it would be highly duplicative for a, for an employer to also provide employer sponsored healthcare insurance when they're already paying, probably paying less, but when they're already paying, um, to finance the single payer health insurance system. Um, so just setting up the single payer system in itself would probably do away with most, if not all the ERISA issues. Um, if you wanted to legally like, like, like really get at this, um, you know, you can take care of it on the provider side. There are all sorts of um, conditions of participation that, um, say Medicare imposes upon providers to participate in the Medicare program. Um, you can envision a, a world in the single payer system where um, providers, if they want to participate in the single payer in the state, which all providers would want to do, because that's where um, you know every single uh, that's how every single you know citizen is in, it, citizen is um, insured. Um, one of those conditions would be that they don't accept insurance from um, you know basically employer sponsored insurance. Um, so those are two ways to deal with um, ERISA. Um, that again, uh, sort of demonstrate that it's not a it's not a legal hurdle. There's not some technicality that dooms um, state based single payer. Um, again, I think there's a lot of either confusion around there or sort of sometimes it can be used politically as kind of a an off ramp or a technicality to just sort of say this is infeasible. And we think it's important to 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 you know emphasize that um, there's really no legal issue here. Um, other barriers or, or or other kind of like legal issues that that potentially could be presented. Um, have to do with the other waivers that um, that we'd want to get as a state. Um, again, you know, th this will this system will only work if we can um, essentially a state based single payer system can um, recoup a lot of the dollars that um, are currently going coming from the federal government 
um, into our healthcare system, albeit in the you know highly fragmented way that 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 we're all familiar with. Um, so this is going to require um, an eleven fifteen you know Medicaid waiver, which is done you know basically I think all states have eleven fifteen waivers in different ways. Um, a thirteen thirty two waiver would be a way to um, get a hold of a um, to get a hold of the funding that currently goes to the Obamacare ACA individual market exchanges, um, and then a Medicare waiver, um, which is the biggest one, which would allow a single payer system to um, in some way or another have control over the funding the, the Medicare funding that's coming into the state. Um, there's currently um, one Medicare waiver, I believe right now is a system that the, the global budgeting system that's set up in Maryland. Um, that's not what a single, that's not what our system would look like, but it would be, you know, it's another example of a, it's an example of an existing Medicare waiver. Um, and, you know, there's currently a lot of, um, you know, the California task force looked at this in detail and consulted with folks in DC about, um, the different mechanisms to get that Medicare funding to the state. Um, and there's, there's pretty broad statutory language. Um, one example is through the um, CMMI, the, the Center for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that was passed in the ACA, it really gives broad discretion to the, the Health and Human Services um, to uh, basically uh, you know, pilot innovative programs. Um, and we think this is um, the most innovative and the most promising and the most sort of organ, organ way of innovating is to set up our own single payer healthcare system. Um, so there seems to be, uh, again, speaking legally, very much a route to um, setting up the system in concert with um, the the federal government right. um, to, to have single payer um, at the state level. And, and again, that's, th those are some of the details that uh, the governance board is going to look uh, further into. Um, but right now, you know, the obstacles we don't think are going to be some sort of legal technicality. It's just um, continuing to build a political will to 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 set this thing up. Right. Great. And, and Tom, can you speak a little bit to um, the other sort of next steps and challenges to this, which is um, getting the um, both the, the public entity that would be the the health plan governance board that would be created by the legislation to work with the public, and also just obviously there's going to have to be massive amounts of organizing and mass public pressure applied to to keep this moving and to win something like this. Yeah. The good the good news is. Once this bill passed, we're going to have a, a window here to really get down again to that basic grassroots organizing because it, um, we won't really be dealing exactly with the legislature so much as to making sure that we build a base, a wider base of support going over the next couple of years because eventually, like I said, this will be a vote of the people. I had told people before that the work to get to this place we wouldn't need a vote of the people. Now I, for the first time saying, yes, in order to restructure how money is collected, <laughs> um, we're gonna have a vote of the people. So that's why that grassroots organizing is gonna be really an essential thing. And we just have to continue to build our base of support. The good news is the system provides the education to the populace, right? Because everybody's got their painful story now. Years ago, maybe you had to explain it, but now everybody's got it. They know of serious consequences. And so we just have to remind them of it and get them involved and prepared for what's to come ahead when the resistance shows up more than it has to date. So that, but we're going to have a window here uh, to do that. And that's what the, the good news is. Great. So um, it's kind of to conclude this, can you can you all paint a picture for us what the end game looks for lo looks like for this? Um, I mean, there's going to have to be uh, what is the what is the crossing the finish line look like here? OK, well, the, the crossing the finish line is the ta the governance board does its work. They get the, they get funded enough. They get their finish their studies and their information. They get the contractors, the analysis. And they put forward the plan, the universal health care plan, to the legislature, which then says, okay. And th so this is, this is not correct. The governor will not have to sign what's put forward to the people as a ballot measure. So sorry for the not correcting the slide, right? And so the next step should be that the, we get the legislator to pass it that should be that one and then the people vote for it and then we become the first state to implement a publicly funded health care to its residents so that 
And then, of course, there'll be the stuff to make everything work well in the system. Mm -hmm. and, what, and what will it take? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of persistence. D never give up. Do teamwork and have hope at every stage of the game. I think that's kind of what it speaks. Um, I'm a, kind of a person uh, that says, if you're not hopeful in, in this huddle of people trying to do this work, you don't belong here. So, Hayden, anything you'd like to say? I think you captured it well, Tom. All right, and is there any other way for folks to learn more um, on your website or elsewhere? If folks wanna, I mean, we'll provide these slides obviously, but. The, besides the slide links, which yeah. are out there, most of the links to the slide are information taken from the task force. Of course, you can add your name, no matter where you are in the country. And I li li literally, literally got a call from somebody from Sacramento, California recently that said, Oregon's leading the way. I want to help there. So <laughs> if we coalesce our efforts, and if you think that Oregon is the place, add your name, keep track of what we're doing. You can go to this QR code and uh, you can, we don't limit our membership. Uh, we got supporters from all over the country. We'd love to have more. And uh, that's kind of it. All right. Well, thanks so much, Tom and Hayden. Um, I, I really feel like this this ballot initiative that you all have, have has already passed is has kind of you know flown under the radar nationally under the for the press. But even within our own Medicare for All movement, I think not everyone in all the other states uh, is kind of aware of what's going on, what the meaning of it was. It was that it amended the Constitution and what the next steps look like for you all to actually win this thing. But I wish you all the best of luck and thank you so much for for uh, joining us and and making it all clear to the rest of us. So thank you for this opportunity. My pleasure. Talk Thanks so much. Talk to y'all soon.